Mark, hey, congr congratulations for uh, Clay, Clay Dream here. Thanks, Gabe. Appreciate it. Um, I, I guess uh, the most important um, congratulations is the fact that uh, it's being uh, showcased at Tribeca. How, how, how do you feel about that? Uh, I feel great about that. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, it's one of the best film festivals in the world and certainly one that we were kind of for many years eyeing as, as a place that we thought would be a great fit to premiere the film. So it's uh, pretty awesome that it's finally happening. That is, that is terrific. So tell us, where, where, what sparked you to do this uh, do documentary uh, for Clay Dream? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it goes back to probably 2015. I was finishing up my previous film and looking for other projects and came across an article um, about Will and kind of the rise and fall of Will Benton Studios and, you know, some of what you see in the film. And I was familiar with Will. Uh, his name, his big mustache, and, you know, a lot of the work, the characters that he'd created, uh, you know, for me, it was like the California Raisins and the Domino's Noid were, were characters I loved when I was growing up. So um, right away, I just kind of felt the nostalgia for this. But also when I was reading about the story, it read like a movie. And um, I thought this sounds, this sounds amazing. I'd love to pursue this. So I reached out to Will, I think that day. That, that that day that I read this article and um, heard back, I found an email online, I think, and heard back from his assistant, who I found out later was was his wife. And, um, and she said, you know, he'll meet with you or he'll talk to you, but he's not interested really in doing a documentary. And uh, so we got together and had like a three hour meeting and I thought it went great. We totally hit it off. And a couple of days later, he said, yeah, I don't think I want to do it. And uh, so I was like, oh, really? I was bummed, but we stayed in touch. And, you know, six months later, after, you know, many phone calls and meetings and things, he came around and said, let's do it. Let's do this thing. And, uh, and then from that moment on, he was, you know, it was, it was a pleasure to, to work with him. And there was a lot of great times. I just, you know, went over to his place without the camera or anything and just had a good time just, you know, chatting with him, a, a, you know, a great artist and a really good person. So it was uh, a, a lot of fun getting to know him. At, at, at which stage was, was he sick um, when you uh, basically uh, talked to him at the time? He, yeah, he was, but I didn't know it. And most people didn't know it, you know, like he says in the film, other than maybe even close friends, a lot of close friends didn't even know that he was sick. And he'd been sick for 12 years when he died. And um, it wasn't until several years into the project that I think I finally kind of pieced it together without him actually telling me. And then, and then finally, you know, we had conversations about it to the point where you see some of it in the film. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, it, it's true to his nature, you know, very positive, very forward thinking. He, and he never wanted, he didn't want to dwell on something that was negative and he didn't want his illness to hijack conversations of, where he just wanted to talk about the fun work that he was doing. And, and he didn't want, and if he wasn't, if he was talking about him being sick, then he couldn't talk about fun projects. And that's what he wanted to really focus on. So um, yeah, he kept it hidden from a lot of people. And, um, and uh, it, yeah, it was, it was, it was tough, uh, you know, go seeing him towards the end when really you could tell that it was taking its toll. And then ultimately, you know, getting the phone call from his, his, one of his sons that he passed away was, was rough. Was all this production took, uh, um, took place in um, Portland or was it elsewhere? Mostly Portland. I mean, there was interviews that I did that were kind of all around, you know, from New York and LA and, um, uh, but the majority of the shooting, uh, you know, certainly with Will was, was in Portland. And then, you know, there's so much of the film that is, um, you know, archive of, of the work and the behind the scenes and things like that, that, that were incorporated in, but, but yeah, I would say that, you know, it's definitely a Portland based production. With, with the uh, other interview subjects uh, for, for this film, were they easy to uh, convince? Because it, it seems like uh, they all love Will and willing to talk. Yeah, um, you know, and there were some that I wanted to get that that for various reasons decided, you know, not to take part. But I interviewed probably 50, over 50 people for the film. And I think there's 17 interviews that ended up being in. So that's always just, you know, one of the harder things is deciding, you know, which sound bites go in. And, and also, you know, I, I, I like to avoid having just like one or two sound bites from, from a person. I like to kind of hopefully build these interview subjects out throughout a little bit as well too. But um, yeah, there was a lot of love, love for Will. And, you know, some I interviewed most, you know, a lot of them I interviewed before he passed away. And then there were some that were after. So that was kind of also an interesting thing, like just 
the process of it and then also the editorial decisions of how to incorporate and was that going to make a difference and um you know i think we pulled it off but um but it was great getting to know a lot of these people that you know um whether it was big time animators that have gone on to do other other huge things um or just friends of him that knew him well it was a really great experience to spend some time with all those people <laughs> i i was i i found uh, your film um, captivating because you have so much um, footage, especially old footage uh, of, of Will and, 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 the, and the studio. Um, how, how, did Will provide you all that or did you uh, have to uncover that uh, you know, indirectly somehow? Yeah, he had a lot. He definitely had a good collection um, and a good collection that was already digitized that he shared early on. And then there was several full days spent just going through things in his, in his um, basement just boxes and boxes and boxes of materials that had never been you know whether it's photographs or or behind the scenes that had never been digitized it was on old tapes so there was a lot of that going through and then there was a, a handful of um people that had worked at his studio over the years that had documented a lot of things too so that was also very beneficial of you know finding these people connecting with them and then they you know them sharing um footage as well so it was a, a variety of sources but it did start with will and his collection which is a nice starting point now i i, I do want to take note even even though this uh, documentary mainly focused on the studio and will but uh, you also added bob in, into uh, your documentary why was it so important to to also tell um, Bob's side of the story into a film like this? Well, I think, you know, so Bob Gardner was Will's co-creator of a film called Close Mondays, which won the, which was Will's first film. Will and Bob created this together um, and it won the Academy Award in 1974 and it really launched Will's career. And Will and Bob were kind of, they were, they were known as a team and they went in different directions after that for various reasons. And I just, I don't think you can really tell the complete story of Will without telling the story of Bob. Um, and Bob, you know, stayed in his life uh, for many, many years after that. Um, and also I think we wanted to give Bob his due respect for his uh, participation in what he did in that film, which was, which was, you know, he was just a creative force. And it's, you know, tragic that we didn't get to see more work from Bob Gardner because he was really an amazing artist um, and you see that in Close Mondays. So I think we wanted to give that, um, you know, pay tribute to him in a way as well too. But but also again, it was something for 30 years that the negative side of things impacted Will. And it was something that, you know, he, he, he was never gonna be able to put that aside. Will wasn't. And so it was a constant part of his life. So I think we had to include that as well too. I'm I'm curious because you you, you spoke to uh, Will um, for so much uh, and and it seems like uh, throughout his entire life uh, in, and and career there there were just a few you know mishaps and missteps along the way. Did did he tell you what which one of them was his greatest regret? Um, was it from Bob to uh, to the Knights or was it to you know not not getting the licensing with the raisins? I mean, what or or selling to Pixar? I mean, yeah. did, did, did he because it, because he He's hard to read because he's so happy. <laughs> he's, yeah, I mean, he's the most optimistic person that I've ever been around or that I've ever heard about. Maybe to a flaw and to potentially even a demise because rather than like really being in the moment and focusing on what the issue was, he would rather have just been like, everything's good. I'm just going to move, keep moving forward and, instead of maybe like taking care of an issue. Um but it's funny you ask that as far as like, did he ever say what his biggest like regret was? I was, uh, I, I was, this was after he passed, I was meeting with uh, his two sons, Jesse and Billy. And I don't know how this conversation came up, but one of them said, yeah, dad always said that the biggest, his biggest regret was um, uh, not getting uh, the licensing for the California Raisins. And then the other one said, oh, he always told me that his biggest regret was when they, they used to own several of these buildings in this part of Portland, Will did, and he sold them. And now they're worth just a fortune, you know, because this was like in the eighties or nineties. So he's, so he's like, yeah, he always said that was his biggest regret. And then I was like, well, what he told me was the Pixar thing. And so like, you've got these just massive things, but he didn't dwell on any of them. Like they, they might've been regrets to the point where like he, in hindsight, he would have done them differently, but he just, he didn't, he just didn't dwell on anything at all. Like it was always moving forward. And then even, you know, getting sick, it was not, it was not something that he dwelled on. It was just he wanted to keep things positive and keep making work, and that's just how he lived his life. I 
the, the one story that I guess a lot of people will, I, you know, for, for, for me, I, I didn't, I didn't really recall was, was, was the night's uh, um, involvement in, in all this, particularly everyone knows about Leica Studios um, today. And, and I, and I talked to Travis Knight, uh, you know, a few, a few times. Uh, why, why, why did you want that, uh, you know, basically that, that little part into the documentary? Hey, Gig, you know what? I think, I, I think I got most of the question you were frozen there for a little bit. So I, I know the Phil Knight side of it. Um, what, what was the, what was the question? Well, I, I was basically um, asking you on uh, why, why, why you wanted to include that into the documentary, because a lot of people do know about Leica Studios and, uh, yeah. Well, um, I mean, I don't think you can tell the, the Will story, you know, at least the story that I wanted to tell without that. I mean, um, you know, I don't know if I want to give it all away to people that haven't seen it, but that was really kind of um, the end of the story in a lot of ways, you know, not the end of Will's life, clearly, but the end of a huge chapter and how that all went down. And really, I wanted from early, early on, I wanted this to be kind of art versus commerce, which, you know, I thought was fitting too, because a lot of Will's most famous work were commercial. So they were making this art for a, com from a, com for a commercial reason. And it's something that I think about all the time, like how would I make, like how to balance the artistic side with the commercial side to make a living and all that. Um, and I also thought it was interesting, you know, that essentially his first partner is Bob Gardner, this just creative juggernaut of a person. That's how he starts his company essentially. And, and it, it, that's how Will starts his artistic journey. And then it ends, with, and that started in a basement, in Will's basement, just the two of them. And then it ends in a boardroom with the richest, one of the richest and most powerful people in the entire world. And just that journey is just incredible. Well, let, 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 me, uh, let me start to wrap things up uh, with you. Um, what was it like to go, uh, go into, uh, you know, Will's, uh, Will's place and, you know, taking a tour with a, uh, I'm sure he showed you a bunch of his, uh, you know, claymation and all in the collections. Of yeah, ones. I mean, and and you know, he's pretty modest, but he still did have certain pieces out, and so those would be so cool to see. Like, oh, there's, you know, there's the raisins, there's the Mark Twain character that would kind of be scattered around the house. There's Michael Jordan, Bugs Bunny. Um, so it was just really, really fun. Like, I, I mean, I remember, uh, but a lot of it was in boxes. So it's like, I don't even know where his Oscar was. I mean, it might've been in his office, but I remember like, oh, this is fun, you know, holding the Oscar. Um, but the most enjoyable thing, go with, you know, working with him and going over to his place, you know, that was all fun, but it would be like stepping out onto his boat and we would just go up the Willamette River on a boat ride and, you know, without the camera or anything. And those are the memories when I think about the project and working with Will that will be, that are, you know, special to me. Excellent. Well, let me, well, um, one last question. When, when audiences uh, finally, finally get to watch a uh, Clay Dream here, what's the one most important take that you hope they walk away with? You, you know, I don't know. That's, um, it's a good question. I don't have an answer for it because um, I think it's going to be different for a lot of people. I think it's really, there's a lot of universal kind of emotions to the story. And um, it'll be interesting to see kind of what people do take away. So I, I don't personally, I, I don't really think about that, um, you know, when I'm making something and maybe I should, or at least when I'm, you know, when, it, when it's coming out, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's the, for the individual viewer to, to watch and decide and, but I'll be interested to see what, what, uh, what they say. Most excellent. Well, hey, Mark, hey, thank, thank you once again uh, for this conversation and congratulations uh, for Clay Dream and congratulations for Tribeca. Thanks, Gig. Really appreciate it. Nice talking to you. Nice talking to you too. Thank you. Bye now.